This should, of course, have been a novel. For years, I packed full-length book material into short stories. This is the life story of a middle-aged, unmarried brother of three selfish sisters. Written about 30 years ago, it is a rather good example of condensation. But perhaps it's dated. You'll know. The story's called The Gay Old Dog. Those of you who have dwelt or even lingered in Chicago, Illinois, are familiar with the region known as the Loop. For those others of you to whom Chicago is a transfer point between New York and California, there is presented this brief explanation. The Loop is a clamorous, smoke-infested district embraced by the iron arms of the elevated tracks. In a city boasting fewer millions, it would be known familiarly as downtown. From Congress to Lake Street, from Wabash almost to the river, those thunderous tracks make a complete circle or loop. Within it lie the retail shops, the commercial hotels, the theaters, the restaurants. It is the Fifth Avenue and the Broadway of Chicago, and he who frequents it by night in search of amusement and cheer is known vulgarly as a loop hound. Joe Hertz was a loop hound. On the occasion of those sparse first nights granted the metropolis of the Middle West, he was always present, third row, aisle, center. When a new Loop Cafe was opened, Joe's table always commanded an unobstructed view of anything worth viewing. On entering, he was likely to say, uh, Hi, Gus, with careless cordiality to the head waiter, while his eye roved expertly from table to table as he removed his gloves. He was the kind of man who mixes his own salad dressing. He liked to call for a bowl, some cracked ice, lemon, garlic, paprika, salt, pepper, vinegar, and oil, and make a ceremony of it. People at nearby tables would lay down their knives and forks to watch, fascinated. The secret of it seemed to lie in using all the oil in sight and calling for more. That was Joe. A plump and lonely bachelor of 50, a plethoric, roving-eyed and kindly man, clutching vainly at the garments of a youth that had long slipped past him. Joe Hertz in one of those pinch waist suits and a belted coat and a little green hat, walking up Michigan Avenue of a bright winter's afternoon, trying to take the curb with a jaunty youthfulness against which every one of his fat and cased muscles rebelled, was a sight for mirth or pity, depending on one's vision. The gay dog business was a late phase in the life of Joe Hertz. He had been a quite different sort of canine. The staid and harassed brother of three unwed and selfish sisters is an underdog. At 27, Joe had been the dutiful, hard-working son in the wholesale leather business of a widowed mother who called him Joey. Now and then, a double wrinkle would appear between Joe's eyes, a wrinkle that had no business there at 27. Then Joe's mother died, leaving him handicapped by a deathbed promise, the three sisters, and the three-story and basement house on Calumet Avenue, Chicago. Joe's wrinkle became a fixture. His mother had said in her high, thin voice, Joey, take care of the girls. I will, Ma. Joey, promise me you won't marry till the girls are all provided for. Joey, it's my dying wish. Promise. I promise, Ma. Whereupon his mother had died comfortably, leaving him with a completely ruined life. They were not bad-looking girls, and they had a certain style, too. That is, Stell and Eva had. Carrie, the middle one, taught school over on the west side. Stell, the youngest, was the beauty. They called her Babe. Thirty years ago, one's sisters did not strain at the household leash nor crave a career. Carrie hated teaching. Eva kept house expertly and complainingly. Babe's profession was being the family beauty, and it took all her spare time. This was Joe's household, and he was the nominal head of it, but it was an empty title. The three women dominated his life. They weren't consciously selfish. 
If you had called them cruel, they would have put you down as mad. When you are the lone brother of three sisters, it means that you must constantly be calling for, escorting, or dropping one of them somewhere. Joe, when he should have been preening his feathers for conquest, was saying, well, my God, I am hurrying. Give a man time, can't you? I just got home. You girls been laying around the house all day. No wonder you're ready. On those rare occasions when his business necessitated an out-of-town trip, he would spend half a day floundering about the shop selecting handkerchiefs or stockings or feathers or gloves for the girls. They always turned out to be the wrong kind, judging by their reception. From Carrie, what in the world do I want of long white gloves? Thought she didn't have any. I haven't. I never wear evening clothes. I just thought she'd like them. I thought every girl liked long white gloves just to, just to have. Oh, for pity's sake. Or from Eva or Babe, I've got silk stockings, Joe, heaps of them. Oh, you brought me handkerchiefs the last time. They never suspected the exquisite pleasure it gave him to select these things, these fine, soft, silken things. There were many things about this slow-going, amiable brother of theirs that they never suspected. If you had told them he was a dreamer of dreams, for example, they would have been amused. Sometimes, dead tired by nine o'clock after a hard day downtown, he would doze over the evening paper. At intervals, he would wake red-eyed to a snatch of conversation such as, Yes, but if you get the blue, you can wear it anywhere. It's dressy, and at the same time, it's quiet, too. Eva, the expert, wrestling with Carrie over the problem of the new spring dress. They never guessed that the commonplace man in the frayed old smoking jacket had banished them all from the room long ago, had banished himself, for that matter. In his place was a tall, debonair, and rather dangerously handsome man to whom six o'clock spelled evening clothes. The shabby old house on Calumet Avenue was transformed into a brocaded and chandeliered rendezvous for the brilliance of the city. Beauty was there, and wit. There was music, the soft sheen of satin, laughter, and he, the gracious, tactful host, king of his own domain. Joe, for heaven's sake, if you're going to snore, go to bed. Why, uh, did, did I fall asleep? We haven't been doing anything else all evening. A person would think you were 50 instead of 30. Babe used to say, Joe, why don't you ever bring home any of your men friends? A girl might as well not have any brother, all the good you do. Joe, conscience-stricken, did his best, but a man who has been petticoat-ridden for years loses the knack somehow of comradeship with men. One Sunday in May, Joe came home from a late Sunday afternoon walk to find company for supper. Carrie often had in one of her schoolteacher friends, or Babe, one of her frivolous intimates, or even Eva, a guest of the old girl type. There was always a Sunday night supper of potato salad and cold meat and coffee and perhaps a fresh cake. Joe rather enjoyed it being a hospitable soul, but he regarded the guests with the undazzled eyes of a man to whom they were just so many petticoats, timid of the night streets, and requiring escort home. This Sunday night, it turned out to be one of Carrie's friends. Uh, Emily, uh, Carrie said, uh, Emily, this is my brother, Joe. Joe had learned what to expect in Carrie's friends. Drab-looking women in the late thirties whose facial lines all slanted downward. Uh, happy to meet you, said Joe, and looked down at a most surprisingly different sort for one of Carrie's friends. This Emily person was very small and fluffy and blue-eyed and sort of crinkly looking. The corners of her mouth when she smiled and her eyes when she looked up at you and her hair, which was brown but had the miraculous effect somehow of seeming golden. Joe shook hands with her. Her hand was incredibly small and soft, so that you were afraid of crushing it until you discovered that she had a firm little grip all her own. It surprised and amused you, that grip, as does a baby's unexpected clutch on your patronizing forefinger. As Joe felt it in his own big clasp, the strangest thing happened to him. Something inside Joe Hertz stopped working for a moment, then lurched sicklingly, then thumped like mad. 
it was his heart. He stood staring down at her and she up at him until the others laughed. Are you a school teacher, Emily? Kindergarten. It's my first year. And don't call me Emily, please. Well, why not? It's your name. I think it's the prettiest name in the world. Joe took her home, and from that Sunday night he began to strain at the leash. He took his sisters out dutifully, but he would suggest with a carelessness that deceived no one. Uh, uh, don't you want one of your girlfriends to come along? That little, uh, what's her name, Emily or something. As long as I got the three of you, I might as well have a full squad. For a long time, he didn't know what was the matter with him. He only knew that he was miserable and yet happy. Sometimes his heart seemed to ache with an actual physical ache. He realized that he wanted to do things for Emily. He wanted to buy things for Emily, useless, pretty, expensive things that he couldn't afford. He wanted to buy everything that Emily needed and everything that Emily desired. He wanted to marry Emily. That was it. He discovered that one day with a shock in the midst of a transaction in the leather business. He stared at the man with whom he was dealing until that startled person grew uncomfortable. Uh, what's the matter, Hertz? Matter? You look as if you'd seen a ghost or found a gold mine. I, I don't know which. Gold mine. No. Ghost. For he remembered that high, thin voice and his promise. And the leather business was slithering downhill with dreadful rapidity as the automobile business began its amazing climb. Joe tried to stop it, but he was not that kind of businessman. You know, Emily, I couldn't support two households now, not, not the way things are. But if you'll wait, if you'll only wait, the girls might, that is, Babe and Carrie might marry a... Of course I'll wait, Joe. But we mustn't just sit back and let the years go by. We've got to help. She went about it as if she were already a little matchmaking matron. She corralled all the men she had ever known and introduced them to Babe, Carrie, and Eva separately in pairs and en masse. She stayed home while Joe took the three about. When she was present, she tried to look as plain and obscure as possible so that the sisters would show up to advantage. She schemed and planned and contrived and hoped and smiled into Joe's despairing eyes. And three years went by. Carrie still taught school and hated it. Eva kept house more and more complainingly as prices advanced and allowance retreated. Stell was still babe, the family beauty. And Emily's hair somehow lost its glint and began to look just plain brown. Now look here, Emily. We could be happy anyway. There's plenty of room at the house, lots of people begin that way and maybe the girls would get used to it and and let you run the household and no no we'd only be miserable i know even if they didn't object and they would joe wouldn't they wouldn't they but you do love me don't you emily oh i do joe i love you and love you and love you but joe i i can't I know it, dear. I knew it all the time, really. I I just thought maybe somehow that was the beginning of the end, and they knew it. Emily wasn't the kind of girl who would be left to pine. There are too many Joes in the world whose hearts lurch and then thump at the feel of a soft, fluttering, incredibly small hand in their grip. One year later, Emily was married to a young man whose father owned a large, pie-shaped slice of the prosperous state of Michigan. That being safely accomplished, there was something grimly humorous in the trend taken by affairs in the old house on Calumet, for Eva married. Married well, too, though he was a great deal older than she, she went off in a hat she had copied from a French model at Fields and a suit she had contrived with a home dressmaker. It was the last of that, though. 
The next time they saw her, she had on a hat that even she would have despaired of copying and a suit that sort of melted into your gaze. She moved to the north side, trust Eva for that, and Babe assumed the management of the household on Calumet Avenue. It was rather a pinched little household now, for the leather business shrank and shrank. I don't see how you can expect me to keep house decently on this, Babe would say contemptuously. If you knew what Ben gives Eva, it's the best I can do, sis. Business is something rotten. Ben says that if you had the least bit of... I don't care what Ben says. I'm sick of your everlasting Ben. Go and get a Ben of your own, why don't you, if you're so stuck on the way he does things? And Babe did. She made a last desperate drive aided by Eva and captured a rather surprised young man who had made up his mind not to marry for years and years. Eva wanted to give her her wedding things, but at that, Joe broke into rebellion. No, sir, no, Ben is going to buy my sister's wedding clothes, understand? I guess I'm not broke yet. I'll furnish the money for her things, and there'll be enough of them, too. Babe had as useless a trousseau and as filled with extravagant pink and blue and lacy things as any daughter of doting parents. Joe seemed to find a grim pleasure in providing them, but it left him pretty well pinched. After Babe's marriage, she insisted that they call her Estelle now. Joe sold the house on Calumet Avenue. He and Carrie took one of those little flats that were springing up seemingly overnight all through Chicago's south side. There was nothing domestic about Carrie. She had given up teaching two years before and had gone into social service work on the west side. She had what is known as a legal mind, hard, clear, orderly, and she made a great success of it. Her dream was to live at the settlement house and give all her time to the work. Upon the little household, she bestowed a certain amount of grim attention. She hated it and didn't hesitate to say so. Joe took to prowling about department store basements and household goods sections. He was always sending home a bargain in a ham or a sack of potatoes or ten pounds of sugar or a window clamp or a new kind of paring knife. He was forever doing odd jobs that the superintendent should have done. It was the domestic in him claiming its own. Then one night, Carrie came home with a dull glow in her leathery cheeks and her eyes alight with resolve. They had what she called a plain talk. Listen, Joe. They've offered me the job of first assistant resident worker, and I'm going to take it. Take it? <laughs> I know 50 other girls who'd give their ears for it. I go in next month. Away? Away from here, you mean? Uh, to live? Well, really, Joe, after all that explanation, but to go over there to live, why, that neighborhood's full of dirt and disease and crime and Lord knows what all. I can't let you do that, Carrie. No, I couldn't. Let me. That's 18th century talk, Joe. My life's my own to live. I'm going. And she went. Joe stayed on in the apartment until the lease was up. Then he sold what furniture he could, stored the rest, and took a room on Michigan Avenue in one of those old stone mansions whose decayed splendor was being put to such purpose. Joe Hertz was his own master, free to marry, free to come and go. And he found he didn't even think of marrying. He didn't even want to come or go particularly. A rather frumpy old bachelor with thinning hair and a thickening neck. Every Thursday evening he took dinner at Eva's and on Sunday noon at Stell's. He tucked his napkin under his chin and openly enjoyed the homemade soup and the well-cooked meats. After dinner, he tried to talk business with Eva's husband, or Stell's. His business talks were the old-fashioned kind, beginning, uh, well, now, uh, looky here, you take, for instance, uh, your raw hides and leathers. But Ben and George didn't want to take, for instance, your raw hides and leathers. They wanted, when they took anything at all, to take golf or politics or stocks. They were the modern type of businessman who prefers to leave his work out of his play. They would listen restively and say, uh-huh, at intervals, and at the first chance they would sort of fade out of the room with a meaning glance at their wives. Eva had two children now, girls. They treated Uncle Joe with good-natured tolerance. 
Stell had no children. Uncle Joe degenerated by almost imperceptible degrees from the position of honored guest who is served with white meat to that of one who is content with a leg and one of those obscure and bony sections which, after much turning with a bewildered and investigating knife and fork, leave one baffled and unsatisfied. Eva and Stell got together and decided that Joe ought to marry. It isn't natural, Eva told him. I never saw a man who took so little interest in women. Me? Women? Yes, of course, you act like a frightened schoolboy. So they had in for dinner certain friends and acquaintances of fitting age. They spoke of them as splendid girls, between 36 and 40. They talked awfully well in a firm, clear way about civics and classes and politics and economics and uh, committees. They rather terrified Joe. He escorted them home dutifully, though they told him not to bother, and they evidently meant it. They seemed capable not only of going home quite unattended, but of delivering a pointed lecture to any highwayman or brawler who might molest them. The following Thursday, Eva would say, How'd you like her, Joe? Like who? Miss Matthews. Who's she? Now, don't be funny, Joe. You know very well I mean the girl who was here for dinner, the one who talked so well on the immigration question. Oh, her. Why, I liked her all right. Seemed to be a smart woman. Smart? She's a perfectly splendid girl. Sure. But didn't you like her? I can't say I did, even I can't say I didn't. She made me think a lot of a teacher I had in the fifth reader, name of Heim, yeah, Himes. As I recall her, she must have been a fine woman. But I never thought of Himes as a woman at all. She was just a teacher. You make me tired, a man of your age. You don't expect to marry a girl, do you? A child? I don't expect to marry anybody. And that was the truth, lonely though he often was. The following spring, Eva moved to Winnetka. Anyone who got the meaning of the loop knows the significance of a move to a North Shore suburb and a house. Eva's daughter Ethel was growing up, and her mother had an eye on society, so that did away with Joe's Thursday dinners. Then Stell's husband bought a car. They went out into the country every Sunday. Stell said it was getting so that maids objected to Sunday dinners anyway. Besides, they were unhealthy, old-fashioned things. They always meant to ask Joe to come along, but by the time their friends were placed and the lunch and the boxes and the sweaters and George's camera and everything, there seemed to be no room for a man of Joe's bulk. So that eliminated the Sunday dinner. Stell said... Now, Joe, just drop in any time during the week for dinner, except Wednesday, that's our bridge night, and Saturday, and of course, Thursday is the cook's night out, but, but don't you wait for me to phone, just you drop in. So Joe drifted into that sad-eyed, dyspeptic family made up of those you see dining in second-rate restaurants, their paper propped up against the sugar bowl, munching solemnly and with indifference to the stare of the passerby surveying them through the brazen plate glass window. And then came the war. The war that spelled death and destruction to millions. The war that brought a fortune to Joe Hertz and transformed him overnight from a baggy kneed old bachelor whose business was a failure to a prosperous manufacturer whose only trouble was the shortage of hides for the making of his product, leather. The armies of Europe called for it. Leather, more leather. Straps, millions of straps. More, more. The musty old leather business over on Lake Street was magically changed from a dust-covered, dead-alive concern to an orderly hive that hummed and glittered with success. Orders poured in. Joe Hertz had inside information on the war. He talked with French and English and Italian buyers commissioned by their countries to get American-made supplies. And now when he said to Ben or George, uh, take, uh, for instance, your raw hides and leathers, they listened with respectful attention. And then began the gay dog business in the life of Joe Hertz. He developed into a loop hound, ever keen on the scent of fresh pleasure. That side of Joe Hertz, which had been repressed and crushed and ignored, began to bloom. At first, he spent money on his rather contemptuous nieces. 
He sent them gorgeous furs and watch bracelets and bags. He took to expensive rooms at a downtown hotel, and there was something more tear-compelling than grotesque about the way he gloated over the luxury of a separate ice water tap in the bathroom. He bought a car, a glittering affair in color a bright blue with pale blue leather straps and a great deal of gold fittings and special tires. Eva said it was the kind of thing a chorus girl would use rather than an elderly businessman. You saw him driving about in it red-faced and rather awkward at the wheel. You saw him too in the Pompeian room at the Congress Hotel of a Saturday afternoon when roving-eyed matrons in mink coats are apt to congregate to sip pale amber drinks. Actors grew to recognize the semi-bald head and the shining, round, good-natured face looming out at them from the dim well of the theater. And sometimes in a musical show, they directed a quip at him, and he liked it. He could pick out the critics as they came down the aisle and even had a nodding acquaintance with one or two of them. So he frolicked ponderously. In New York, he might have been called a man about town. And he was lonesome. He was very lonesome. So he searched about in his mind and brought from the dim past the memory of the luxuriously furnished establishment of which he used to dream in the evenings when he dozed over his paper in the old house on Calumet. So he took an apartment many roomed and expensive, with a manservant in charge, and furnished it in styles and periods ranging through all the Louis. The living room was mostly rose color. The war went on and on and on, and the money continued to roll in a flood of it. Then one afternoon, Eva, in town on shopping bent, entered a small, expensive shop on Michigan Avenue. Eva's weakness was hats. She described what she sought and stood looking about her after the saleswoman had vanished in search of it. The room was becomingly rose-illumined and somewhat dim, so that some minutes had passed before she realized that a man seated on a raspberry brocade settee not five feet away, a man with a walking stick and tan gloves and a check suit, was her brother Joe. From him, Eva's wild-eyed glance leaped to the woman who was trying on hats before one of the many long mirrors. She was seated, and a saleswoman was exclaiming discreetly at her elbow. Eva turned sharply and encountered her own saleswoman returning hat-laden. Not, not today. Not, not today. I'm, I'm feeling ill suddenly. And Eva almost ran from the room. That evening, she told Stell. He looked straight at me. My dear, I thought I'd die. But at least he had sense enough not to speak. She was one of those limp, willowy creatures with the greediest eyes that she tried to keep softened to a baby stare and couldn't. She was so crazy to get her hands on those hats. I saw it all in one minute. You know the way I do. I suppose some people would call her pretty. I don't. And her hair, well. And the most expensive-looking hats, not one of them under 75. Isn't it disgusting at his age? Well, I'm glad Ethel wasn't with me. The next time, it was Stell who saw them in a restaurant. And the third time, it was Ethel. She was one of the guests at a theater party given by Nicky Overton II, the North Shore Overtons, Lake Forest. They came in late and occupied the entire third row at the opening performance of Believe Me. And Ethel was Nicky's partner. She was glowing like a rose. When the lights went up after the first act, Ethel saw that her Uncle Joe was seated just ahead of her with what she afterward described as a blonde. Then her uncle had turned around, and seeing her had been surprised into a smile that spread genially all over his plump face. Then he had turned to face forward again quickly. Who's the old guy? Nicky had asked. My uncle. Nicky had looked at the blonde, and his eyebrow had gone up ever so slightly. It spoiled Ethel's evening. Eva talked it over with her husband in that intimate hour that precedes bedtime. It's disgusting, that's what it is. Perfectly disgusting. There's no fool like an old fool imagine a creature like that at his time of life. Well, I don't know, Ben said. I suppose a boy's got to sow his wild oats sometime. 
Don't be any more vulgar than you can help. And I think you know as well as I what it means to have that Overton boy interested in Ethel. If he's interested in her, I guess the fact that Ethel's uncle went to the theater with someone who isn't Ethel's aunt won't cause a shudder to run up and down his frail young frame, will it? All right. If you're not man enough to stop it, I'll have to, that's all. I'm going up there with Stell this week. They did not notify Joe of their coming. They would drive to Joe's apartment together and wait for him there. When she reached the city, Eva found turmoil there. The first of the American troops to be sent to France was leaving. Michigan Boulevard was a billowing, surging mass. Flags, pennants, banners, crowds. All the elements that make for demonstration. And over the whole, quiet. A solid, determined mass of people waiting patient hours to see the khaki clads go by. Their car was caught in the jam. When they moved it all, it was by inches. When at last they reached Joe's apartment, they were flushed, nervous, apprehensive. But he had not yet come in, so they waited. Stella and Eva, sunk in rose-colored cushions, viewed the place with some mirth. Carrie ought to be here, Eva said. They both smiled at the thought of the austere Carrie in the midst of these rosy cushions and hangings and lamps. Stella rose and began to walk about restlessly. She picked up a vase and laid it down, straightened a picture. Eva got up, too, and wandered into the hall. She stood there a moment, listening. Then she turned and passed into Joe's bedroom. And there you knew Joe for what he was. This room was as bare as the other had been ornate. It was Joe, the clean-minded and simple-hearted, in revolt against the luxury with which he had surrounded himself. None of those wall pictures with which bachelor bedrooms are reputed to be hung. No satin slippers, no scented notes. Two plain-backed military brushes on the dresser, and he so nearly hairless. A little orderly stack of books on the table near the bed. Eva fingered their titles and gave a little gasp. One of them was on gardening. A book on the war by an Englishman, a detective story of the lurid type that lulls one to sleep. His shoes ranged in a careful row in the closet with a shoe tree in every one of them. There was something speaking about those shoes. They looked so human. Eva shut the door on them quickly. Some bottles on the dresser, a jar of pomade, an ointment such as a man uses who is growing bald and is panic-stricken too late. Some soda mixture on the shelf in the bathroom and a little box of pepsin tablets. Eats all kinds of things, I suppose, at all hours of the day and night, Eva said, and wandered out into the rose-colored front room again with the air of one who is chagrined at her failure to find what she has sought. Where do you suppose he can be? It's, why, it's after six. And then there was a little click. The two women sat up, tense. The door opened. Joe came in. He blinked a little. The two women in the rosy room stood up. Why, Eve, well, babe, well, why didn't you let me know? We were just about to leave. We thought you weren't coming home. I was in the jam on Michigan watching the boys go by. He sat down. The light from the window fell on him, and you saw that his eyes were red. He had indeed found himself one of the thousands in the jam on Michigan Avenue. He had a place near the curb where his big frame shut off the view of the unfortunate behind him. He waited with the placid interest of one who has subscribed to all the funds and societies to which a prosperous middle-aged businessman is called upon to subscribe in wartime. Then, just as he was about to leave, impatient at the delay, the crowd had cried with a queer, dramatic note in its voice, Here they come! Here come the boys! And just at that moment, two little, futile, frenzied fists began to beat a mad tattoo on Joe Hertz's broad back. And a voice, a choked, high little voice, cried, Let me by! I can't see! You, you man, you, you, you big, fat man, my boy's going by! to war and I, I can't see. Let me by. 
Joe scrooged round, still keeping his place. He looked down, and upturned to him in agonized appeal was the face of Emily. They stared at each other for what seemed a long, long time. It was really only the fraction of a second. Then Joe put one great arm firmly around Emily's waist and swung her about in front of him. His great bulk protected her. Emily was clinging to his hand. She was breathing rapidly as if she had been running. Her eyes were straining up the street. Why, Emily, how in the world? I ran away. Fred didn't want me to come. He said it would upset me too much. Fred? My husband, Fred, he, he made me promise to say goodbye to Joe at home. Joe? Joe's my boy, and, and he's going to war, so I ran away. I, I had to see him. I had to see him go. Why, sure. Of course you want to see him. And then the crowd gave a great roar. There came over Joe a feeling of weakness. He was trembling. The boys went marching by. There he is, there he is, there he is, there. Which one? Which one, Emily? The handsome one. The handsome hand. Point him out. Show me. Never mind. I see him. Somehow, miraculously, he had picked him from among the hundreds. He had picked him as surely as his own father might have. Emily's boy. He was marching by rather stiffly. He was 19 and fun-loving. And he had a girl. And he didn't particularly want to go to France and to go to France. But more than he had hated going, he had hated not to go. So he marched by looking straight ahead, his jaw set so that his chin stuck out just a little. Emily's boy. Another minute and the boy had passed on up the broad street, the fine flag-decked street, just one of a thousand service hats bobbing in rhythmic motion like sandy waves lapping ashore and flowing on. Then he disappeared altogether. Emily was clinging to Joe. She was mumbling something over and over. I can't. I can't. Don't ask me to. I can't let him go like that. I can't. Why, Emily. We wouldn't have him stay home, would we? We, we wouldn't want him to do anything different, would we? I'm glad he enlisted. I'm proud of him. So are you. Glad. He took her to the car that was waiting. They said goodbye awkwardly. So it was that when Joe entered his own hallway half an hour later, he blinked and when the light from the window fell on him, you saw that his eyes were red. Eva was not one to beat about the bush. Now look here, Joe. Stell and I are here for a reason. We're here to tell you that this thing's got to stop. Thing? A stop? Oh, you know very well what I mean. You saw me at the milliner's that day, and night before last. Ethel, we're all disgusted. If you must go about with a woman like that, well, please have some sense of decency. You've got us to consider, your sisters and your nieces, not to speak of your own self. You. You. You didn't consider me 20 years ago. You come to me with talk like that. Where's my boy? You killed him, you two, 20 years ago, and now he belongs to somebody else. Where's my son that should have gone marching by today? Where's my son? Answer me that, you two, miserable women. Where's my son? Out of my house. Out of my house. The door banged behind them. 
Joe stood shaking in the center of the room, then he reached for a chair, sat down. He passed one moist, flabby hand over his forehead, and it came away wet. The telephone rang. It sounded far away and unimportant, but it rang and rang. Hello. Is that you, Joey? Yes. How's my boy? I'm all right. Listen, Joe, the crowd's coming over tonight, and I fixed up a little poker game for you, just eight of us. Well, I can't come tonight, Gert. Can't? Why not? Oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling so good. You just said you were all right. I, I am all right. Just kind of tired. Is my Joey tired? Then he shall be all comfy on the sofa here, and he doesn't need to play if he doesn't want to. No, sir. No, sir. Hello. Hello, are, are you there? Yes. Joe, there's something the matter. You're sick. I'm coming right over. No. Why not? You sound as if you'd been sleeping. Uh, say, look here. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Long after the connection had been broken. He stood staring at the instrument with unseeing eyes, and he turned and walked into the front room. All the light had gone out of it. Dusk had come on. All the light had gone out of everything. The zest had gone out of life. The game was over. The game he had been playing against loneliness and disappointment. And he was just a tired old man. A lonely, tired old man in a ridiculous rose-colored room that had grown all of a sudden drab. In the early spring of 1945, when the horror we call the Second World War was still raging, I found myself in the beautiful and historic city of Weimar in central Germany. Weimar, famous as the dwelling place of Goethe, now was infamous for its Nazi concentration camp and death factory, Buchenwald, just outside the city. Buchenwald had been liberated by Allied troops just before my first sight of Weimar. The United States Air Force had, in the last months of the war, assigned me to a writing job that included in its territory parts of Germany, France, Italy, Belgium, England. Outside Weimar was an American Air Force base. The first day of my arrival in Weimar was spent in seeing Buchenwald camp. What I saw there was so unspeakable, so subhuman, so paralyzing in its revelation of the depths of degradation to which the human race can descend, that I lost all sense of perspective. I shall not go into detail as to what I saw there. This had been a Nazi camp for war prisoners of all sorts. Guilty of no crimes, they lived there under brutality and savagery, were tortured there, died there by the thousands and thousands. That most wonderful of mechanisms, man, that most precious and exalted of human possessions, the spirit of man and the human dignity of man, had been outraged beyond the comprehension of anyone who had not seen this place. Numbed, deeply depressed, I returned to my billet in the town of Weimar. It seemed to me that if this could be done by humans to humans, then I no longer wanted to be a member of the human race. That same evening, I was scheduled to have dinner at the air base with the general in command. After dinner, I asked to visit the enlisted men's club nearby. This was not on the program, but finally it was arranged. The impact of youth, of virility, struck you as you saw the big club room that served the enlisted men. Talking, reading, smoking, playing games, they seemed unbelievably young to be engaged in the grisly business of war. A piano was being played somewhere, someone was singing. I met groups of the young men, we talked. A dark-haired young fellow who had been standing apart came up to me and spoke my name. He stood there a moment, a curious and wistful little smile on his face. Then, without a word of explanation or preliminary announcement, 
Still with that winning half-smile on his face, he began to recite from memory an entire page of the novel Showboat. He knew every word of it as he stood there in that crowded, smoky, noisy room in the town of Weimar, Germany, notorious now for horror instead of beauty, with the spirit of Goethe and the evil shadow of Buchenwald hovering over it and war poisoning the air of every continent on the globe. It was incongruous. It was unbelievable to hear him. The excerpt described the moment before the curtain rises on the lamp-lighted auditorium of the old river showboat back in 1875, the showboat that brought magic and forgetfulness and romance and entertainment to the little scattered isolated towns along the rivers a half century or more before the day of the phonograph, the motion picture, the radio, television, or even the theater as we know it today. Certainly there was nothing startling or even important in the lines he had somehow learned. This was perhaps the nostalgia of a homesick boy who might have been slightly stage-struck like myself, for I am and always have been stage-struck. In the strange land of bloodshed, brutality, and war violence in which he now found himself, perhaps these pages had somehow offered him peace and escape from the monstrous things that were beating upon his sensibilities. As I stood there seeing him and hearing him and seeing the young, handsome, manly, wistful face, I began to feel free of the despair and bitterness and rage that had racked me after the horror of Buchenwald. It seemed to me that night that if young men such as this one could love and remember books and plays in the midst of war and the fear of war, then our civilization never could actually be destroyed by brutality. Here is the brief excerpt from Showboat, and I speak it for those who know and love the theater and who will understand the boy's mood and his charming, gaily defiant act. Up the river bank from the boat landing to the top of the bluff flared kerosene torches suspended on long spikes stuck in the ground. There was something barbaric and splendid about them against the dusk of the sky and woods beyond, the sinister mystery of the river below. They made a weird spectacle of the commonplace. The whites of the Negro's eyes gleamed whiter. The lights turned their cheeks to copper and bronze and polished ebony. The swarthy coal miners and their shawled and sallow wives, the farmers of the corn and wheat lands, the backwoods poor whites, the cotton pickers of Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi, the small town merchants, the shambling loafers, the lovers two by two were magically transformed into witches, giants, princesses, crones, gnomes, Nubians, genii. Those dimes, quarters, and half dollars poured so willingly into the half oval of the ticket window's open mouth found their way there often enough through a trail of pain and sweat and blood. Black faces, white faces, hands gnarled, hands calloused, Men in jeans, women in calico, babies. They came to the showboat timid, wide-eyed, wondering, like children. Now the band struck up. The kerosene lamps on the walls were turned low. The scuffling, shuffling, coughing audience became quiet, quiet. There was in that stillness something of fright. Seamed faces, furrowed faces, drab, bitter, sodden, childlike, weary. Sometimes, startlingly clear-cut in that half-light, could be glimpsed a profile of some gaunt southern laborer or backwoodsman in that audience, and it was the profile of a portrait seen in some gallery or in the illustration of a book of history. A nose high-bred aquiline, a sensitive, haughty mouth, eyes deep-set, arrogant, Spanish, French, English, the blood of a Stuart, a Plantagenet, some royal rogue or adventurer of many, many years ago whose seed, perhaps, this was. The curtain rose. The music ceased jerkily in mid-bar. They became little children listening to a fairy tale. A glorious world of unreality opened before their eyes. Things happened. They knew that in life things did not happen thus. But here they saw, believed, and were happy. Innocence wore golden curls. Wickedness wore black. Love triumphed. Right conquered. 
Virtue was rewarded, evil punished. They forgot the cotton fields, the wheat fields, the corn fields. They forgot the coal mines, the potato patch, the stable, the barn, the shed. They forgot the labor under the pitiless blaze of the noonday sun, the bitter, marrow-numbing chill of winter, the blistered skin, the frozen road, wind, snow, rain, flood. The women forgot for an hour their wash tubs, their kitchen stoves, childbirth pains, drudgery, worry, disappointment. Here were blood, lust, love, passion. Here were warmth, enchantment, laughter, music. It was anodyne. It was lethe. It was escape. It was the theater. <laughs>